Okay, welcome back to our Cyber Physical Systems course. Today we're going to finish uh, chapter three on the details of cyber physical systems, addressing some uh, advanced and sort of big ideas uh, on a smart cities, which probably is the ultimate uh, cyber physical system due to its uh, complexity. So if we think of a uh, smart city, we can think about the critical infrastructures that sustain the livelihood of the people that live in a city. So the question is, how can we leverage technology and furthermore intelligent technology to enhance, uh, make better those services, and even create new, new services that ultimately make the livelihood of the people in the city uh, better? So we can think of those infrastructures as the one depicted in this diagram. Uh, we can think of smart water supply. So we just had some type of um, water issue this, uh, this weekend. So could we have had uh, sensors to um, <clears throat> forewarn us and so they could do something without uh, interrupting the supply. So that's, um, that's a possibility. A big part is mobility. A big part is mobility. So transportation, we had a, um, a section just talking about transportation, but now even that that we thought was a complex system, now we're bringing that in into this hyper system of systems. Energy, that's also can be part of a smart city. And uh, we had also looked at that as its own cyber physical system. So what we are looking at is that we, we can have this system, this huge cyber physical system in a smart city that is a compendium of other cyber physical systems. So you can imagine the, uh, the complexity, but what we're going to be saying is that the technology is there, the fundamental technology is there, and the question is how do we have the methodology to apply that technology to make this very complex uh, and interdependent cyber physical systems uh, happen. So we can also have uh, waste management, the information and uh, communication technologies, smart administration, so from the actual logistics of the city, we think uh, city hall, for example, how can that be uh, made uh, smarter and smoother through the use of technology? Healthcare, uh, obviously we, we talked about that one as well. Education and public uh, safety. So the, uh, the police and the first responders, for example. So if you, uh, what, is, what, is, what is that a city needs to do? So a city is a service provider for its citizens. Uh, it is also a collection of enterprises. So you have the citizens, you have the enterprises, which that's where the citizens uh, work. They work at enterprises and institutions. And then you have the tourists, so the people that are visiting the city. So those are the main four groups that if you were going to think about what type of services or technologies you can apply to make what these groups do better, that, those are the groups that you need to be thinking about. And thinking about from the standpoint of sustainability, not only from an environmental perspective, but also from a business perspective. So something that is sustainable from a business perspective is that it's a high efficiency high return on investment type of <laughs> enterprises and activities. So when we think of also sustaining the citizens, we have to think about uh, groups like the elderly. How do we better assist, um, have assisted living type uh, infrastructures? Uh, not only um, assisted living, but also resilient living. So that is also safe and secure, and how can we implement intelligent 
uh, solutions across industries. So now we have all these enterprises that may be operating at silos, and but they are servicing one another as peers in the economy of the city. How can we make that more efficient? So if we make that more efficient, obviously the profitability of these enterprises is better and the livelihood of the citizens will be better. So, and that gets, um, that goes along with the networking of integrated urban resources. So that is public safety, uh, education, uh, all, the, all the core and basic infrastructure that the city supplies to the citizens as uh, services. <clears throat> if we have that, then the, the idea is that the quality of work and life in the city uh, goes up, and that goes to see, makes the city more attractive, more attractive to tourists, more attractive to people that want to come in there and live there and work at the enterprises. So the enterprises have the ability to attract better talent. And so is this uh, self-fulfilling uh, positive feedback loop that results in the city becoming a better, a better place? So that's what the things that we are, we're thinking about, the things that we, we, we will be talking about. Well, we're going to be sort of um, concluding is that the Internet of Things is the backbone in the future uh, core technology and infrastructure to make this collection of complex cyber-physical systems uh, take place. And that is a, seg a good segue into the next chapter, with, which is a specific on uh, Internet of Things, and um, we will be giving some hints and some, um, some previews of what we're going to be discussing in the next chapter in the context of the smart city. So, so there are some uh, <clears throat> technologies that are more advanced than others. So for example, uh, cloud computing is quite available, uh, but it's still a growth, a growth area. Even though you hear a lot about it, um, there's still a growth area uh, when it comes to cloud computing and how that infrastructure can in, be interdependent and collaborate with the Internet of Things, which is much further behind. It's the Internet of Things right now is in its infancy, and we can see, we're going to be able to see a step up. Uh, kind of a, a quantum improvement in adoption when 5G uh, comes uh, in earnest in the next two to three years. Uh, because communication is a big part. Communication of connected, distributed, and mobile devices is going to be key. And that infrastructure is going to be provided uh, chiefly by, by 5G wireless uh, infrastructure. So we're going to have all this data, uh, smart web, uh, smarter web uh, searches, and the pervasive computing, which we also have a chapter on that, that's also going to be a key. In essence, every device is a computing node in this huge network, and that's going to really uh, facilitate all, all kinds of, uh, all kinds of services, and applications that we can only, you know, the idea is that you are aware that that's the way to go, so you dream up of these uh, technologies and, and possibilities. So let's make some statements, some forward-looking statements about uh, smart city in the smart city context, uh, about Internet of Things and, and things of that nature. So. Uh, Smart cities activities are connected by the Internet of Things. So that's the idea. The Internet of Things is the backbone. Everything is connected. Everything has an, ac an access uh, and an address. And that's going to uh, require sensor networks. 
we're going to look at sensor networks in detail and networking technology in the next chapter. And I found you, you hope you find that interesting. Uh, <clears throat> and the idea is that these sensor networks are going to be able to dynamically, so dynamically means in real time, measure data, all kinds of data. So supply, not only supply, consumption as well, so demand, and manage then through intelligent computation and algorithms, manage the demand. And that management needs to be an optimization process. So not only manage it to control it, but to control it in such a way that resources are, the usage of resources is optimized. And that's going to take, again, one of the things that we have been saying that is important is the modeling of this system. So that's going to take algorithms that is going to necessitate good models to come up with the algorithms to manage the collection, controlling the demand in a manner that is, that is optimized. So if you have that infrastructure, so it's symbiotic. The infrastructure is required for the Internet of Things, but the Internet of Things is the backbone of the infrastructure, so it's tied together, okay? It's this positive feedback loop uh, of technology emergence. Another statement, uh, the, specific to the Internet of Things. The idea is we're going to connect everything and anything in this uh, wireless network that is going to also be self-configuring. So we're going to see in the next chapter the different topologies that this network can take, and we're going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of each topology, and depending on the demand, real-time demand, this network can reconfigure their topology to make the communication to make the communication more effective. That's going to be an interesting discussion um, in the next chapter. So the Internet of Things uh, came out of a study or uh, research center <clears throat> that, that, that is based at MIT, and it's been around the term for a long time. As it is, things take a long time to catch up with the feasibility, the actual practicality of it, and the timeliness of it is that we are at the cost of the deployment of 5G, which is going to be the key communication technology for the Internet of Things. So that, uh, that's exciting. The Internet of Things is going to be the backbone of a smart city, as we said, interconnecting the objects, and computers in this pervasive uh, computing space such that every, if the market, if there is a market for it, the premise is that there will be a market for products and services that will plug into the Internet of Things infrastructure. If there is that demand, the technology is, be, is going to be there such that anything can have their own internet, uh, their own IP address, their internet protocol address, and they're going to be able, according to their function requirements, according to their functional requirements, be as simple and as complex as necessary, but the complexity is going to be derived from the application. There is going to be a baseline functionality of communication and connectivity that is going to be a given. <clears throat> so that way you can collect all sort of data and uh, control all sort of agents. <clears throat> so I think that if we are not there, uh, we're already there where there are more things connected to the internet right now than people. Um, and 
with the Internet of Things, we are looking at an order of magnitude uh, beyond that. So, and that's going to be a byproduct of these cyber-physical systems being put in place because they will make business sense. I mean, we're not saying that these things are going to happen because they are nice. They're going to happen because the citizens are going to see a value proposition on these advanced services and products, and they're going to, they're going to pay for it. Um, so that's, uh, that's exciting as well. So what we are going to be seeing as well is that in the last chapter that we cover on Industry 4.0 is specifically in this topic is that we are really going to be go, going through a, the fourth industrial revolution that mankind has seen where the way that we produce and manufacture uh, and also manage complex infrastructures is going to change um, and provide many, many opportunities uh, for, for the people. So imagine testing these algorithms, way of optimizing things with the concept of the digital twin. That, that's, a, that's a technology that I am um, very, uh, very excited about. I mean, I, th I think uh, that I find it very, uh, very interesting. Right now, the two countries in the world that are leading technology is the United States and Germany in Europe. Some of that stuff comes from the Germany think tanks and also from German companies. Up the road, Princeton, uh, in Princeton, um, Siemens, which is a huge conglomerate, uh, of, of a German company, they have a research center. And one of the activities that they're doing there as research is this digital twin. So um, I have been able to be there. Uh, they invited me uh, as a speaker uh, a, few, um, a few months ago. And they actually have an assembly line where they study this concept of the digital twin, that they have a model and the model of the assembly line, and they can change the assembly line digitally, measure the efficiency of this new configuration, optimize the configuration without doing anything mechanically on the actual physical assembly line, and then they just download that to the assembly line, and the assembly line reconfigures itself. So that's one. The other one is that the digital model has also the ability of optimizing, finding the optimal solution, giving some constraints by itself, and then replicating that to the physical environment. So that's actually um, a very interesting project. And it's in a research center. It's not, still not in the real factory. But this is technology that is being developed so that we can model things and deploy that to the physical world. So that, that, from a manufacturing perspective, is one of the pillars of this Industry 4.0 that really represents the fourth uh, industrial revolution that we have seen. So as we wind down the, uh, the chapter in uh, talking about a smart city and these big ideas. Uh, let's, uh, let's conclude by remembering, again, the Internet of thing, uh, Things, key enabling technology in smart cities. What are the specific things that these devices that are connected in this backbone, this pervasive backbone are going to be doing. They're going to be actuating, addressing, communicating, interfacing, identifying, it's a big part of the Internet of Things, identification, management of the network, so self-configuring and uh, contributing as peers in the management of the network in the, um, optimizing uh, the same. They have to have resilience, 
which is reliability and security from a cybersecurity perspective. They're going to be doing routing, so that's part of this reconfiguration. Uh, they're going to be doing sensing, clearly, so we can collect data and use that data in the optimization of the optimal control of the infrastructure, and of course, uh, communicating. So what are the, uh, the recipients of these services and products? Uh, so administration, we can, we can foresee e-government so that there is more access to government provided services and that will foster more interaction and open new lines of communication. In the communication infrastructure, <clears throat> High-performance uh, computing, and in this uh, high-performance computing, self-repairing services and uh, systems and platforms, this will give more access to a broader group of demographics that may not have all the access uh, at, at present, not only uh, in terms of ethnicity, but also the age uh, and the commuting distance. That right now, some people may not have access because they may be in rural areas away from the city, but if there are other ways of accessing services uh, that is easier and resilient, then there will be more access for, uh, for those people. <clears throat> there will be more, <clears throat> there, will be, there will be more integration of educational services into smarter education platforms. So again, education is easier, uh, less costly. Uh, we're, we're all interested in that. And uh, that can be brought about by better technology. Energy, no doubt, an environment we, have, we talked about that, <clears throat> as well as health. So again, those are the big infrastructures, the critical infrastructures of a city that will be um, benefiting from the technology. Another tier <clears throat> of benefit is uh, markets in the city. So the way that people go about uh, Procuring goods and services, uh, mobility, the way to make public transportation more um, more efficient, more appealing. Uh, if we can make uh, public transportation more appealing and more efficient, that will have a huge impact in the uh, in the quality of life. Security for sure. Uh, in terms of the security of the, the citizens. And then, how do we integrate? What are the systems that you could think of that could integrate all of this into a seamless way, something that is very heterogeneous, to really make these complex systems function more efficiently? It's a big, it's a big job. It's a big opportunity as well. And what we're saying is that the technology is there if we apply the discipline and the methodology of system level design and modeling to come up with this, with this systems and services. <coughs> so uh, a little bit more about mobility and um, intelligent transportation. So we're talking about not only land base, but certainly in as much as we can make, as much as we can, what can be made electronic, electronic, but there's still a need to move physical products and services in and out of big cities. And that causes, that is today is a huge bottleneck. Um, for example, getting goods in and out of, not, not so much out, but getting goods into New York City 
is a big problem. It is a big problem, and it causes uh, a lot of uh, a lot of issues and a lot of unhappiness for the people that live there. Um, you have big trucks blocking traffic to unload, and that can cause uh, big big traffic jams. So we have the issue of the distribution and the movement of goods, but also the um, the public sort of public transportation like trains and uh, and buses. All that could make uh, could be made much better, and it will result in better energy efficiency, which in the end is um, has direct economic implications as well as uh, environmental implications. Part of mobility is going to be communication. So see, here are some ideas that where the Internet of Things could play a role. Uh, you could reduce energy demand with programmable logic controllers that benefit from the harb um, from the harvesting of data through sensor networks to reduce the energy demand by rerouting traffic smartly. Of course, this is going to necessitate that these vehicles are connected to the networks like the wide. Uh, wide uh, area networks, wide local area networks, and public transportation could really uh, flourish with new options and, and opportunities. Managing traffic through the wireless uh, cellular networks, where it's uh, using GPS and the wireless uh, cellular network, and managing better the uh, transportation and logistics. So again, how do we move products from one place, you know, physical products from one place to another uh, in, in, a, in a smarter way? So technology and the Internet of Things, the ability to track goods and services or, or goods, uh, the ability to be able to sense and use that data in advanced computing paradigms to control and manage better the transportation and logistic uh, infrastructure, that, uh, that would result in a lot of benefits. So you could, uh, you could envision as we, we move towards sort of a cashless uh, Society, and it's not a matter of um, of if; it's a matter of when. Where the amount of information <clears throat> and how smart that information can be processed and communicated <clears throat> will guarantee timely information. That you get timely information if you are using public transportation, for example, uh, you can pay electronically. You can electronically, you can get um, a status of your bus or your train electronically, real-time updates. The, um, the management services of that public transportation um, enterprises could get also data on occupancy to be able to dispatch more or less so it makes the service optimized, more fluid, more convenient, and then hopefully more appealing. These are services that at times, and many times, are underutilized because they are very rigid and they're not really appealing. They're not convenient. And people are not going to subscribe to things that are not convenient. They have to be convenient, and that's where technology will play this, uh, this role. Just as a reminder, we are uh, doing the, the section on transportation, smart transportation. We talked uh, for quite a while about smart traffic lights. 
So again, that's going to be a very important part of um, our smart city. And we discuss how a smart traffic light that could have deployed sensors that are away from it could actually measure the flow of traffic and dynamically optimize the changes of the faces to get smoother traffic on a more uh, coherent rhythm. That's one thing we discuss, but we also discuss the ability of a light to actually communicate from a peer-to-peer -peer and a collaborative perspective. We're not talking about the traffic light taking over your car, but we're talking about the traffic light sending information, sort of a strong recommendation, if you will, that if you set your speed at this speed, you will not have to stop. You will get to the light right on time so you can keep going. So avoiding this, um, the congestion that uh, stopping and going traffic um, produces. So back then when we discussed transportation, we said that more than a quarter of a trillion dollars is um, wasted a year in the top 30 uh, cities of the, um, in the top 30 cities of the world. So, so of that, about three quarter, I mean, um, a quarter of a billion, uh, of a trillion dollars, uh, 63.1 billions is in the U.S. So, so that is that, that is about more than 20 percent. So, of the 30 cities, one country has the cities with that account for more than 20 percent. So, 63.1 billion uh, U.S. dollars um, are wasted because of congestion. And that causes 3.7 billion hours of delay, so lack of productivity, and 8.7 billion gallons of wasted fuel. So that's a yearly, a yearly cost. So that was according to a study um, done in Texas. So that gives you an idea of the potential. So there is a real tangible monetary benefit to fixing the congestion issue with the smart transportation uh, technologies. Another one uh, added here, uh, beside the traffic control that we talked about, is the parking. So parking, smarter parking. Um, um, I'm surprised that we we don't have, for example, here, we don't know when a parking lot is is, is full. Why why don't we have that technology? I mean we have the technology, we can we can connect things and network them in such a way that we should be able to tell if the parking lot is full. <clears throat> so a person doesn't have to waste 15 minutes circling just going around because we don't know. Um, so the parking situation can be made more efficient by identifying vehicles, by counting and connecting that, and having a service where I can get on my phone, this parking lot that you're next to is full. Don't bother. Go to the next one. Or they're all full. Go to a remote parking lot and have a have a, uh, a boss or something that takes you, and hopefully that boss is autonomous and electric. So a lot of, uh, a lot of things can be done and will be done. These are innovative things, a lot of opportunities for innovation, and um, that's great. So if we have uh, these capabilities, we can think of beyond a cyber physical system, this collection of cyber physical systems in smart cities is what we're going to be calling a cyber physical infrastructure. Of course, these infrastructures are physical right now. 
what we are adding is the connectivity and the computation or the computational intelligence, and that's the cyber. So now we have this cyber physical infrastructures. That's exciting. And it can solve all kinds of um, urban problems by collecting data on real time, timely uh, resource allocation, so more efficiency of the resources that are there, and better decision making, so that's optimization. That's optimization, not only the, the, the automatic decision making, but also giving humans more data so they can make, there's always going to be some decisions made by humans, so how do we make those decisions? How do we aid through technology for those decisions to be better? So some steps that we can see being taken, and this is a, um, in the sense of system, rigorous systems engineering, design, and functional requirements allocation. First step, identify the data that can be available for reliable and secure uh, communication. What, what data do we have, can we have access in a secure and reliable way? And then how, do, based on that data, so that's like a raw materials, if you will, how can we use that data to specify rigorously decision support systems in a smart uh, city cyber physical infrastructure. That is the first step. Sort of uh, brainstorming all the data that is there that could, could be accessed. And then we can, of course, specify the devices that we need to collect that data. Some will be available, some have to be developed. But then, from a system perspective, from a cyber physical infrastructure system perspective, what are the functional requirements based on the data that we have and in the sense of rigorous systems engineering, how, how can we for, uh, use formal verification methods to develop, to capture, develop the capturing of the data and manipulate the physical properties. So how do we, do we define the output part that coupled to the physical part of this cyber physical infrastructure, while at the same time optimizing the techniques because, as we have discussed, is so much about coming up with the services and the product as it is coming up with the techniques. The techniques also have to be optimized. We have articulated that we don't have all the methodology. If anything, what we have more readily than anything is computing. Computing resources and computing power we have. That is the easiest one to get. Second one, and very soon we're going to have a lot of it with 5G. Second one is the communication part. What we lack is the system methodology to be able to utilize it effectively. That, that is the key. And identify the opportunities, which is also not only a technical issue, but a, a business issue as well, in terms of having the, the, the vision of what these services and, and products uh, can be. So that's kind of like the the end uh, of what I wanted to cover in, <clears throat> in chapter three, and again, it's being on the, some details on cyber physical systems. So we talked about what cyber physical systems are. We talked a lot, a lot about the recommendations and how we um, gather design requirements 
for uh, cyber physical systems. And then we, uh, we talked about a number of applications sort of to spur the um, ideas and opportunities in all those different domains that we looked at. And then we, uh, we concluded talking about smart cities, which are a cyber physical system of cyber physical systems and the internet of things and everything of which we'll take a closer look in the next chapter. So that concludes uh, chapter three. Thanks.